Kia ora and welcome to Screen Lab number 2 for Compo 230. In the previous lab we looked at the essential information regarding the tuning of strings and some of the basic bowing techniques. We looked at the difference between on the string and off the string bowing as well. In this lab we'll be looking primarily at the left hand. But before we get on to that I want to finish off talking about the right hand by talking about some of the most fundamental changes of the timbre the string instruments have up their sleeve and that's pizzicato. Pizzicato is simply plucking the string, or strings, with a finger of the right hand. If we zoom in, you'll see how players use a special technique for holding their bow with the right hand while plucking. This allows them to rapidly shift between pits and arco. Composers, particularly in the early 20th century, exploited this ability to rapidly change between pizzicato and arco in their music a lot. Ravel was particularly fond of it in his more colourful passages. Here's an extract from the string writing in Ravel's String Quartet in F, showing multiple idiomatic techniques, particularly rapid pits arco changes. There are a number of ways of doing pits, but there are three main techniques. The first is the standard pluck, which is simply marked pits and cancelled with arco. The second is called the Bartok pits, in which the player pulls the string up and lets it snap against the fingerboard. Note that the Bartok pits takes longer to produce than a standard pits, so you can't have Bartok pits as in fast succession. The last kind of pits is a left hand pits, which is, as you might have guessed, performed by the left hand. This means that you can have extremely rapid arco and pits changes, but there are limitations to this technique, especially dynamic limitations. You just can't get the same amount of volume out. Let's watch some videos now of all three of these techniques. Firstly, there's the fourth movement of Bartok's fourth string quartet. It's marked Allegro Pizzicato, and it's a veritable treasure trove of different pizzicato techniques. You'll see single pizzas, pits multiple stops, pits strums, pits tremolos, Bartok pitzes and Sulpont pitzes. Let's watch and I'll commentate along the way. We start with just standard pizzicato. If you look at the viola player here, even though he has a three note chord, he's plucking all strings at the same time. And the same with the cello there as well. That was a pizzicato gliss in the cello. Now we've got strums, you see that Bartok uses the roll notation, and there's some Bartok pizzicatos. Left-hand pits is not normally seen in orchestral writing, but it is featured especially in the virtuosic solo violin repertoire. Paganini's Caprices Op. 24 with its famous theme and variations features numerous violin techniques. Let's watch violinist Antal Zalai perform this difficult and remarkable intertwining of normal arco notes with left-hand pitzes. Let's now turn our attention to the left hand, particularly to left hand fingering and positions. The basic idea is that as you get higher up the fingerboard, the pitches get closer together. 
This is because of the principle that to raise the pitch of the string by an interval, you divide its length by a certain constant. For instance, to raise the pitch of the open string by an octave, you divide its length by 2. So looking at the G string on the violin, the low G3 will become a G4 if we stop the string halfway up. But to raise that pitch another octave, we have to divide the already subdivided string by 2 again. This means that the string is now a quarter of its original length. Therefore, the string is now three quarters of the way up the string, and that's getting near to the end of the fingerboard, as you can see. If we wanted three octaves above the open string, we'd have to divide that by two again, making the string now one eighth of its original length. The finger is now seven eighths of the way up the string, and this is now beyond the end of the fingerboard. Let's also talk about the position of the hand. Here's a picture of a violinist playing in their home position, which as you can see is down by the nut, the hand in what we call first position. The most natural fingerings here allow us to play G on the open string, then with first finger down an A, then second finger down a B, third finger down a C, and fourth finger down a D. To go higher up the scale, we'd normally stay in first position, but shift now to the D string. There are, as you move into higher positions, several things happen. One is that the notes get closer together, which makes intonation and practicality harder. Second is that the string gets shorter, and the sound therefore becomes more intense. There are times when the composer would like a passage to be played in a higher position for that timbral intensity, even though the passage could be played in a more comfortable lower register. This is particularly if the theme itself has a high degree of expressive intensity at this point. And this brings us to the question of string indications. There are four main situations in which you want to give a string indication. The first is when you want to indicate that a passage should be played in a higher position than the more normal and more comfortable lower positions in order to imbue a greater timbral intensity. In the following extract from Bartok's Sonata for Solo Violin, the composer indicates that the performer should play the entire opening line on the G string. You'll see in this performance how high the violinist's hand climbs up the fingerboard and the increasing sense of intensity that accompanies it. The second situation is to clarify a particular string cross crossing gesture. In this example from Sarajevo's solo cello work Set Papillon, the composer starts by wanting a rapid oscillation between the open A string and a harmonic on the D string. Note that if she had not indicated the 1 and 2 underneath the opening two notes, then the cellist would probably be quite confused as to exactly what she wanted. Next, in bar 2, she indicates that the bow gesture should rapidly switch from string 1 to string 2 to string 3, and then back up again. Also, it's not entirely clear, looking at the pitches, that that's what she would have intended without the Roman numeral string indications underneath to help to clarify this. At the end of the second line, she expands this gesture to go from string 1 to 2 to 3 to 4, and then back up again. This creates a wave-like motion of the bow on the strings, a technique called arpeggiando that we'll meet later in this lab. The third situation is to help preempt a necessary string configuration. By this I mean that at the end of a passage phrase or gesture, the player must be on a certain string, but that this might not be obvious at the beginning. It's nice therefore if the composer can indicate what string you have to start on, 
so that the player could in theory sight read the passage. There are two common situations in which this could occur. The first is when you have a staggered double stop in which the top note enters first. In this extract from for solo cello, the composer has indicated in brackets that the top note has to be played on the A string while the bottom note has to be played on the D string. The second situation in which this often occurs is when you have a downward glissando which cr crosses over one of the pitches of the open strings. For example, in these violin glissandi, the end pitch is lower than the E open string, which means that you can't execute this glissando on the E string. Instead, you have to perform it on the A string. To help the performer out with this, the composer has therefore indicated a Roman numeral 2 at the start of each gesture. The last situation is just to clarify which string natural harmonics are to be played on, and I'll return to this in another lab. Let's turn now to playing chords on string instruments, or as they're called, multiple stops. The first thing to point out here is that the bow is flat, but the bridge is curved. That means that a string player cannot bow more than two strings simultaneously. Bowing two strings at the same time is called a double stop. Double stops are an extremely idiomatic part of solo and chamber repertoire. We'll talk more about their limitations and constraints in a moment, but in the meantime, let's go back to the Paganini variations to hear some more double stops being played. In this extract, we hear parallel octaves being played. In this next passage, although they do not look like double stops, in fact they're very similar because the violinist simply holds a parallel octave hand position, but bows each string individually. The left hand position is really the same shape as we saw in the previous extract. in this passage, the notes are in parallel thirds, and then in the second line this expands out to parallel tenths. Notice how the hand stretch is considerably greater in the parallel tenths. Next, there's triple and quadruple stops. Because the string player can't sound all three or four strings at once, they have to roll the chord, usually in a downbow. Notice in this famous Bach Chacon that Joshua Bell doesn't even bother to play the bottom note of the upbow chords. We just have to imagine the bottom voice continuing on through. You can see how Bach's notation is more aspirational than actual here. It's left to the violinist to get as close as they can to the original intention 
Before we get on to the possible hand stretches, let's summarise the use of multiple stops. Firstly, in chamber ensembles, the use of multiple stops is idiomatic. Double stops add richness to a sonority, and as they get louder they add greater emphasis. Triple and quadruple stops are particularly emphatic. But you can also have soft double stops to fill out a harmony. Bear in mind that this is really only for chamber music. In the orchestra, the strings will normally divide if they're presented with a chord, unless you specifically ask them to perform a multiple stop. Here's an extract from Debussy's String Quartet in G minor that shows particularly idiomatic use of multiple stops. In the climax in the second system, Debussy scores double and triple stops with repeated down bows to indicate that he wants maximum emphasis on these notes. But then notice in the third system that the dynamic drops down to piano and the double stops in the second violin and viola are simply there to fill out the harmony. They don't have a particularly emphatic function anymore. Before we go on to look at the available multiple, multiple stops on the strings, there's one thing you should know, and that is that as a general rule, the double bass conventionally never plays double stops. Actually, if you look at contemporary chamber repertoire, you'll probably see plenty of them, but in the more traditional chamber and orchestral music, multiple stops never really appear. Okay, now let's have a look at the hand stretches. So, here's star violinist Hilary Hahn showing a relaxed but relatively extended hand stretch. As a general rule, most ordinary violins can reach about 8 cm between the first finger and their little finger. To turn that into musical terms, we can see what the interval would be when the hand is in its lowest position. On the violin, 8 cm in first position makes roughly about a tritone. On the viola, it's about a perfect fourth, and on the cello, it's about a major third. But note that if we take that stretch of 8 cm further up the instrument, but note that if we take that stretch of 8 cm further up the fingerboard, the interval becomes much wider. So for example, that tritone on the violin can now become about an octave on the one string. Note that those intervals apply if we're stretching on the same string. So this is the widest interval that could be written for a finger tremolo. We'll come back to that later. Now, of course, if you move one of your fingers over to the next string, you can play a wider interval because the second string is tuned a fifth higher. So if we add a fifth to a tritone, then you end up with a minor ninth, which is usually the largest double stop recommended in lower position on a violin. Having said that, if you rem remember back to the Paganini Caprices, you might remember that passage we looked at which had the parallel tenths. Well, it is possible to stretch that interval, but have a look at our violinist's little finger that's just in frame on the right-hand side as he plays that stretched chord in bar 3. That's the second chord in bar 3. You can see how his little finger is splayed out at quite a nasty angle. It's a bit unnatural and does take quite a lot of practice and agility. Actually, Paganini himself in an interesting medical condition called Marfan syndrome, which results in unnaturally elongated limbs with often double-jointed parts. Here's a rare photo of him playing his violin, and just look at that left hand. So, here are the basic principles of working out multiple stops, particularly double stops. Firstly, the two strings involved in the double stop must be adjacent. So 4 and 3, or 3 and 2, or 2 and 1. You can't have a double stop between string 1 and 4, unless it's pizzicato, but certainly not arco. Secondly, if one of the two strings is open, then the double stop is good, no matter what the interval is. Finally, if the two adjacent strings are stopped with fingers, then you need to work out whether the interval fits within the maximum stretch. To do this, you can drop the top note down a perfect fifth and have a look at the resulting interval. <laughs> 
it will work if it fits within the maximum stretch interval of a tritone for violins, a perfect fourth for violas, and a major third for cellos. Having said that, cellos have a sneaky trick. Because their thumbs are not being used to hold up the cello, they can whip them out from behind the neck and use them to stop the string instead. This means that the maximum stretch is no longer from first finger to little finger, but from thumb to little finger. This gives them about a tritone's worth of stretch, which means that they can reach parallel octaves like the violin can when double stopping. Here are the general intervals that double stop well on the different string instruments. On violin and viola, anything from seconds up to octaves are comfortable. On the cello, thirds to sixths are comfortable in the normal position, but you can go from seconds up to octaves if the cellist moves into thumb position. There's one further tricky gotcha. Double stop fifths are awkward if they move quite a bit around. Because while it's easy to play a single static fifth, because you just use a single finger laying across two strings, when you start to move that finger around, you often get intonation issues rather quickly. And a final bit of advice, as a general rule, avoid double stops where the bottom note is more than an octave above the open string. As we saw in the video of the pizzicato movement from Bartok's fourth string quartet, pizzicato chords can be played either simultaneously or strummed. If you want them strummed, please use a roll indication as in this extract. Now let's talk about triple and quadruple stops. As I mentioned before, the bow can only touch two strings at once, so triple or quadruple stops are rolled when played arco. For example, this chord on the left will be played like this chord on the right, and therefore it's actually best to notate in that manner. It is also possible to write that roll rhythm more specifically if you want to move the bow from the bottom double stop up to the top double stop in a specific rhythm. Now let's talk about how to check the stretch on triple and quadruple stops. First of all, once again, the strings must be adjacent if it's an arco, triple or quadruple stop. Secondly, if one of the strings is open, then check the remaining double stop to see if it's possible. And finally, if all of the notes are stopped, then use the following guide. Transpose the top note down two perfect fifths and the second note down one perfect fifth and then have a look at what the total span of that chord is. And if that fits within the maximum stretch interval, then your triple stop is probably fine. The same principles of hand stretching can come in handy when you're thinking about tremolos. There are essentially three main types of tremolo. Bowed tremolo, undulating tremolo, and fingered tremolo. The first two of these are tremolos of the right hand, that is, the bow itself is the object that is oscillating. The last one is a tremolo of the left hand, that is, of the fingers on the fingerboard. We've looked at bowed tremolos before, here's an example from Ravel's Ma Mère Loy to remind you. Notice how for unmeasured tremolos there are always three strokes unless the note already has a beam or flag, such as in the quavers here, when the slash is reduced to only two. Note that you can put a bow tremolo on a double stop as well, such as in the first four bars of this extract from Ravel String Quartet. Notice that you can't tremolo a triple or quadruple stop. If you want to have an oscillation across more than two strings, you will need to use the technique called arpeggiando that we'll come to later. Notice how in the fifth bar of this extract, the indication changes. Though it looks like essentially the same chord, it actually moves from being a tremolo double stop to a fingered tremolo on one string here, played on the C string. If you watch this clip of a string quartet playing this passage, I'll zoom in on the violist 
so you can watch what his hands are doing. Notice how it changes in bar 5. <laughs> goes. In some instances, the stretch for a finger tremolo would be too large to reach on one string. In that case, you would finger the two notes as a double stop and then oscillate or undulate the bow between the two. This is called an undulating tremolo. In this example from Debussy's La Mer, it looks like a finger tremolo but the fifth is actually too large to stretch in this low position on the cello. As such, the cellists have to hold a fifth double stop and undulate the bow. Watch the principal cellist in this video of this extract. The final technique we'll look at today is arpeggiando. Arpeggiando is kind of like an undulating tremolo, except it's cro across three or four strings. The right arm moves up and down in a wave-like motion. You normally repeat the notes on the bottom of the top strings like this. This is the canonic extract from Paganini's Caprices Opus 1, and again we'll finish by watching our wonderful violinist play this 